So, hello everyone. I welcome you on the automotive panel discussion. Uh, my name is Martin Perina, and I'm working as a manager in the uh, automotive uh, part of our organization. And today I would like to introduce you my colleagues who I'm working with. So here we have like Pierre-Yves Chibon, he's principal software engineer and the product owner for the container on wheels team. I have Rachel Sibley, who is senior principal QE engineer, and is working as a QE automotive uh, lead for the, uh, for the automotive effort. And also we have Daniel Walsh, uh, senior distinguished engineer and the lead architect uh, for the containers runtime platform in Red Hat. So uh, before we will get uh, some kind of our question, of course, uh, we will give uh, talk to you, but at the beginning, let me pass the microphone and my colleague will tell you what they are working on currently. Uh, good morning, everyone. So I'm uh, Pierre-Yves Chibon, also known as Pingu, more known as Pingu, more normally. Uh, I'm in the, as Martin said, I'm the product owner for the Containers on Wheels teams, which also stands for the COW team, which gives us the opportunity of doing a bunch of bad pun jokes. Uh, it's been, the team has been created about a year and a half, and we still keep container moving and doing demo every week. So yeah, we're pretty good with bad pun jokes. Uh, the responsibility of the team is to do uh, to look at everything that has to do with running containers in the cars. Uh, what are the challenges? How do we how do we run them? How do we manage them? Uh, what are the challenging uh, associated with that? So it's a it's a pretty interesting area, and uh, I have a talk about it uh, at uh, two, I believe, this afternoon in this room uh, to talk about IRTA, and we'll go into more details into that here. Hi, good morning. I'm Rachel Sibley. I'm the QE technical lead for the in-vehicle operating system and automotive. Um, I'm also the product owner for a testing enablement team, and our goal is to migrate existing rail tests um, that relate to the safety scope uh, and run them in an automotive um, environment. So, um, yeah. Um, I have a talk later on if you want to learn more about that and functional safety and what that means. And uh, it's at 4.15 today in this room. Yeah, by the way, this microphone does nothing other than for the thing, so everybody's thinking. So we're going to try to talk loud. So uh, my job, I, uh, nine months ago, I moved into the, the Rivos team. Uh, I, I consider myself, my main job is to get containers running everywhere inside of Red Hat. That's my uh, sort of my focus. Uh, and when it comes to automotive, I'm looking at how we can use containers in the car, how we use the technology to satisfy a lot of the requirements for us to get approved as an operating system that can run inside of a, a moving vehicle. Okay, so done. So I will ask a question for you because like we have published several blogs uh, in the Red Hat blog and one of the most, let's say, controversial or most visible thing was that we don't believe that the Kubernetes is good to be running on your car. So Dan, could you please explain? Start with the Z question. So we'll start out by saying I love Kubernetes. I want OpenShift to be successful. And, um, but uh, uh, Kubernetes has some key issues. When we talk about putting, uh, the reason we bring up Kubernetes in a car is most of the automakers, you know, that's sort of the first thing out of their mouth is we want to get into this cloud native world and you know, this whole buy into Kubernetes. And uh, there are going to be multiple computers in a car, so why not just use Kubernetes to move you know, different containerized workloads uh, around in the vehicle. Uh, well, we're going to be talking, um, by the way, I didn't mention, I have uh, container boff, uh, I think at 2 o'clock this afternoon, same time. Yeah, we're competing, so if I get more numbers oh, on him, you. yeah. You know that, so you know what Mine's just going to be general, you know, similar to this, just general questions about containers, and I'll be showing, I'll potentially show some cool stuff, but, uh, and then uh, tomorrow at 2, what time, 2, two o'clock, 2.30, I'm doing a talk, containers on wheels, uh, or containers and cars. Um, so it's going to be a, uh, I'll show a lot of the technologies and, and talk about it. But uh, Herte is, is one of the key ones. Anyways, going back to uh, Kubernetes in a car. Uh, so when you're driving a car, um, one of the key things in any type of moving vehicle is what they call functional safety. So functional safety means basically we want to make sure that the 
you don't do anything to injure someone with, with a moving vehicle. So it's, it's a, somewhat similar to security in that you want to make sure that the system works correctly. Uh, but in functional safety, we want to make sure, for instance, you might have an app that's, let's say, applying the brakes. And then you have another app that is running Netflix. Well, you want to run, make sure the Netflix app is not like dominating in such a way that the brake app can't fire, function, fire off. Um, in, in the world of Kubernetes, uh, so basically when you want to have an app a execute, that app has to execute, okay? So be, to be functionally safe. Um, in Kubernetes, they, they have the concept of eventual consistency. Right, so you want to eventually your app to come up and uh, or eventually the environment to be up and running. Um, so obviously that is not the same thing as the app has to be up and running. So we can't use uh, Kubernetes and Orchestra. The other thing is trying to get to functional safety, you have to uh, really look into the code, really examine the code and explain how the code always works on time. When you get into multi-threaded applications that are written totally in something like Golang, um, it becomes a lot more difficult. So um, lastly, Kubernetes applies a heavy workload. So in, in a Kubernetes environment, there's always a lot going on, right? There's a, there's a heavy, heavy, um, uh, the kubelet, cryo, they're always doing stuff. So they're always using CPUs, they're always um, performing stuff. So there's a lot of reasons not to use Kubernetes in a car. And for our uh, low overhead, uh, orchestration is Herte, which is what he'll be talking about um, this afternoon. And I'll be talking about a little bit in mine tomorrow. Thanks, Dan. So as you mentioned, the functional safety is one of the biggest challenge or the biggest uh, problem that we are trying to solve uh, within the automotive effort. So Rachel, could you please talk about like, you know, how do we handle and how do we test functional safety? Easy. Oh, okay. <laughs> She's going to make it happen. Uh, no. <laughs> no uh, uh, so for testing uh, the in-vehicle operating system, we need to, well, functional safety or FUSA requires 100% requirements test coverage. Uh, so that can be a bit challenging, uh, especially the way we inherently do it with RELQE. We're not designing tests 100% functionally testing um, a, an API, for example. We take a lot of what's upstream, we rerun it. So uh, part of this is running the tests uh, against our requirements, which are the uh, APIs. Um, running them, identifying where are our gaps. We use code coverage analysis, GCOV, to assist us with that. Um, developing new tests to ensure that we have that 100% coverage. Um, so a lot of what we're doing with testing is we want to leverage uh, existing tests from RHEL. We don't want to fork their tests um, or have duplication there. So we're um, rerunning all of the existing RHEL tests and then adding new tests for any of the gaps that we're finding. And a lot of these, of course, are tailored around uh, the safety scope. Um, and we're adapting them to an automotive environment because the tests weren't designed to run uh, in an OS tree environment. They're you know, designed to run against an RPM traditional compose. So there's some tweaks or changes to the test to get them to run an OS tree and then migrating them to an updated test framework uh, depending on where we're running them. So um, yeah, for, for testing, yeah, it's definitely quite challenging to also establish the traceability. We need to have requirements down to the test cases, um, the executed runs, the logs, the failures. Every failure needs to be linked to an existing issue. All of this needs to be traceable. We have to have the evidence. We have to have um, retention policies in place. Um, so uh, we have a lot of work to do. I just want to point out there's a key word that she mentioned multiple times there, evidence. Um, so in, to me, functional safety means eventually if a vehicle causes an accident or a machine causes an accident and you go in front of a court of law, you have to have evidence that you did everything f to make the system as functionally safe as possible. So that's, you know, so that's really what we're trying to do. Is what, this will be the first time Linux operating system has ever achieved functionally safe to to describe Linux in, in terms of being as safe as possible right doesn't mean accidents are, gonna, are not going to happen but it what 
eventually you might have to get in a court of law to prove that we did everything possible or our partners did everything possible so to, to prevent an accident right yeah. um, to follow up on that a little bit one of the one of the example I like to take is uh, you know you certify an, an API and that API can be something as simple as you know open open a file and write content to it and the idea of the, the functional safety is to make sure, to, to guarantee that you know, if you use that function, what it will do is open a file and put content into it. If there are very specific use cases, there are very specific conditions under which, you know, if I give it a 42K uh, buffer frame and I'm pointing to a spe very specific place in the file system, in, under these conditions, the function does not behave as it should, that's a problem. That's, that function is no longer functionally safe. So it's, it's going a lot through the code, examining it, and ensuring that it behaves the way it does. That doesn't mean that it, the, the, the way you, can, you can't use the, func the function to actually do something bad, but it, me it means that, you know, it's, the example I do is uh, you have a gun, you shoot yourself in the foot. The gun has worked the way it's supposed to be. You, you pull the trigger, it fires the bullet. If you, the fact that you are aiming it at your foot is your responsibility. The gun did what it did. So the function to open a file and write content to it does what it did. If you use that function to mess with the canon parameter that landed with a crash of the compute unit that triggered the accident, then you know, the function is what it was supposed to do. The fact that you used it wrong is your responsibility. And a lot of FUSA has to do with this. It's you know, where does the responsibility lay and can we track that, res that responsibility? Uh, and you know, so it's, it's a lot of going through all the codes, it's a lot of doing through all the test cases, and that's why the test cases are important and the traceability of them are very important because they are the proof, they are the evidence that the function does what it's supposed to be doing. And some functions are very easy, open a file, write a file, some functions, sorting functions, for example, becomes a lot more, uh, a lot more challenging and there are, how do we handle exceptions, how do we handle the edge cases, and all of these are becoming, back to what Rachel was saying, testing is important there. Thank you. Uh, as you all said, like you know, uh, the the functional safety is one of the core uh, problem that we are trying to solve, and that uh, also like comes with the where the Linux can move on, right? It's kind of very well established on the computers and servers. It's uh, prob most probably also very well established in the edge devices. Now we are trying to get the uh, Linux to the cars, which is like, you know, completely new level regarding this functional safety. So, Pierre, do you think there are kind of other categories where we could get or other areas when after we will get into the cars, it, it, this work will not be specific only to cars, but we can expand? Um, from discussions we've had recently, there is definitely an interest in what we are doing. There is the, the entire automotive industry is, is curious of what we can do and what we can offer with it. Uh, the idea about being able to update systems, being able to have a life cycle, uh, you know, a single software stack that is applicable, that is maintainable across multiple generations of cars is something that is very appealing uh, in the same way that, you know, it's nice to be able to run well night on a on different generation of servers. Uh, and not having a specific version of an operating system for a specific version of a server. Uh, so the, the automotive industry is very much interesting in what we're doing, but they are not the only ones looking into us. Uh, we have had this recently discussions with industries that are less regulated than automotive, but that are still sufficiently critical that they actually rely on uh, softwares and software and software stacks that are used in automotive industries, but without necessarily the certi functional safety certification. Uh, one, one example we've met recently is a mining company uh, that operates you know, heavy machinery, and they are not as critical from a, a functional safety perspective. You know, if it's a, if uh, the engine breaks in the mine, it's probably going to be less dangerous than you know, if a computer crash on the autopilot in the highway. Uh, but it is still sufficiently important for them that they're actually looking at these kind of stacks. Um, but down the line, there are also other areas that are AV regulated, but that will have certifications similar to the one that we are working towards with automotive. Uh, you can think like autonomous trains. They'll have a different set of requirements, but there will be a lot of overlaps with what we are looking for in the automotive industries. Medical devices are another, another area where they are very strong, very, very complex, uh, you know, certification you can achieve, but there is also a lot of overlap with what we do in automotive. So there is, 
industries, you know, if Linux manages to enter in the functional safety areas of automotive, it is the footstep in the door to a number of other areas for highly regulated that may, that may involve that may look at what's being done in automotive, that may look at the, 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 evol the way the standards is, is evolving, because there is also work that's being done at Red Hat to, ma to make the standards um, evolve. The, the standard has been written, uh, I don't know, 20, 30 years ago, something like that, and hasn't really evolved since. And the, you know, the IT industry has changed tremendously since. Uh, the core fundamental of how the standard was written is still applicable today. Uh, but the way we do it, and especially the way we do it in open source software, where you know every single open source software was started by a highly descriptive written requirement document uh, that is highly implemented and covered in 100% test uh, coverage. It's like I'm sure every open source project in the room is fulfilling all of these requirements. No, really, you do. <laughs> you have highly described requirement documents and 100% test coverage. <laughs> uh, so, but no, but that doesn't mean your your project is not actually, you know, following the spirit of some of these documents, even if you don't realize them today. So, it's one of the things that we are trying to also influence is the the ISO community, the standards to make to be able to make them amendable to other approach to software development that relies on you know crowdsourcing reviews, highly uh, available. Uh, uh, test uh, test devices, the test suites. Um, you know, the Linux kernel is probably one of the most scrutinized piece of software. The number of industries, the number of people looking into it, it's a very complex one, but it's also one of the most reviewed piece of software. And yet, it does not today satisfy the, the, ISO, the ISO standards, uh, but that doesn't mean in its spirit what the ISO standards wants to do is incompatible with the way the kernel is being developed. Uh, so there is work being done there, and it's probably going to open other areas in the future to have these discussions again. Does that answer your question? OK. <laughs> Thanks. So uh, any questions from you that we would like to ask? Uh, apart from, uh, from functional safety, which we just spoke about, right, and the usual things, the usual security things which we do with Red, uh, is there anything else which you need to do with uh, in, in the like operating system or some of the security problems also, like, you know, than, than just like that, you know, get, if a container is responsible for, for breaking, uh, it would be bad if they take a denial of service on that container. Right? I mean, these things we usually don't take care when, when we request security from other companies. Okay, so, so I will try to repeat. The, so the core question was like, you know, if there are any other areas other than the functional safety which we need to take care about. Um, I, my kids used to play a video game called Need for Speed. And um, so in, in a vehicle, there are uh, requirements, like you turn the car on, Within two seconds, and these are legal requirements. Within two seconds, a bing has to happen, and a noise has to be made that tells you to put your seatbelt on. Um, if you put the car into reverse, the reverse camera has to come up within two seconds. So there's there's uh, lots and lots of requirements. So I think it was a talk yesterday on turning on the backup camera within uh, as fast as possible in the Linux kernel. Um, so imagine going from a cold start you know, the operating system not, and being booted so that it makes a sound within two seconds. Um, so there's lots of stuff going on. We, in, the, in the Podman team, we spent uh, probably about eight, ten engineers to try to um, optimize Podman for starting a container. And when, when we started out, we were about two seconds for on a really low-end Raspberry Pi. So we wanted to make the machine as low-end as possible. And we were able to get it up to about 0.3 seconds. So we six times faster starting. Now for a human being, if I hit Podman, hit carriage return, like, you know, the container starts within one second, it's not, you don't even notice it. But um, when you're worried about uh, starting it up, uh, our partner in this is General Motors, and they want us to go negative time. So they, they want us to create a, uh, a, a time machine, yeah. So. Uh, other things? Uh, the the user experience uh, of the the you know 
the central s system in a car is a lot different from what we're used to in, in a data center. Uh, Dan mentioned the, the boot time requirements. You know, if you, you start your car, you don't want to have to wait multiple seconds for the system to be ready. You want to get in your car, start the engine, and drive. Uh, same thing for the application, the starting the podman. Uh, you know, when you click the button, you don't want, you don't want to, to wait. Uh, you know. If you take a, a Kubernetes cluster, a uh, data center server that will take minutes to start, uh, you know, if Podman takes a few seconds to start the application after that, you don't really care. You've been waiting five minutes for the server to reboot anyway. Uh, so, you know, a couple of seconds is not hard. The, the entire user expectations, there are challenges. We are speaking about an edge device uh, that we need to protect physically because the user has access to the device, physical access to the device. So we need to protect it from actually the user tampering with the device, but we also need to protect the software once it's running from, um, how to say, from uh, uh, a non-human <laughs> triggered uh, random event that would curb the software. God corrupting the file. Bas basically, if, uh, again, going back to functional safety, if you're driving along and all of a sudden you get a corruption in, on a disk. The, the system has to realize that. So you can't, you can't cause an application to mis, mis, misrun, right? So if a file or an object in the file system gets corrupted, we have to know it. So we, we're looking at like DM Verity and, and different functions. So the, a big effort um, has been this um, thing called ComposeFS, which is a composable file system that we can actually apply some of the rules of DM Verity and, and on, FS Verity um, onto the file system. Basically, so the kernel will, uh, while you're reading a file, the kernel will know that that file got corrupted. And so then we can re realize it and basically put the car into safety mode, right? Pull the car over to the side of the road into the breakdown lane and, and call on a US thing called AAA and get a tow truck out there to tow the car. Right? Um, there's also the concept of freedom from interference, so we need to ensure if there's a cascading failure that's happening from the quality management side of things, which is non-safety aspect code, if that's cascading into or uh, affecting or um, preventing a, a safety function from delivering its capability, then that would be bad. So we need to ensure that we, for a testing perspective, we have um, freedom FFI uh, test cases to ensure that uh, there's isolation between the ASLB code, safety code, and the non-safety code aspect to ensure there's no interference there. So the question. So the question is, what, do we, what happens if we get a kernel panic or a seg fault? Uh, that, is the, that, is the, that is one of the core elements of the functional safety aspect is uh, we sh we're not supposed to be able to get a seg fault. Uh, but that's, that's one of the idea of functional safety. You ensure that the function behaves the way it's supposed to be. Uh, and you know, the people using the functions are also due to do functional safety on their application. So it's not only we, the functional safety basically is a layered approach where we build on the, we are, we build the operating system, which is built on top of a functionally safe C certified firmware. And then functionally safety certified applications will be built on top of a functionally safety certified operating system, uh, which means you can't have a functional safety certified uh, application that does not run on a functionally safety certified operating system. So it's, it's very, every, every layer on the stack it needs to be certified for the top level application to be. So one of the things is you, doc you have to document all of this. The, the, in part of the functional safety is like, okay, the question was uh, what happens if there is a, if there is a you know, file system disk permission error when you try to write a file. Uh, the, the functional safety documents, all the, all the work that Rachel is doing and documenting in tests are, comes with basically a pretty big user manual uh, and we basically get to tell the OEMs, you know, RTFM and make sure that your codes is compliant with the way we describe how it works. So we, the, not only are the documentation going to tell you how, how to use the code, but also what, what are the different exceptions that will be raised and how the code, uh, you know, what, what will be triggered so that the code can, can handle such an exception. Yeah. So, I mean, so the, if, if something goes wrong in the car, 
So the, the, the goal is for the car to know that something went wrong. So it's, uh, again, if you run out of disk space on the car or a fun, actually a segmentation fault happens, then we have to relay that information up to you know, the monitoring program that's running on, uh, to see what car, and then the monitoring program will take action. So a, a classic example would be you're in self-driving mode on the highway um, and it'll notify the driver of the car to take over, that the human being has to take over. I'm, I'm dropping out of self-driving mode because something went wrong. Um, so from an operating system point of view, our job is to not only describe what happens. You know, if you write code like this, you could have a chance of running out of disk space. Right? So that's us describing what functional safety. But if an app on the third node blows up, System D is going to realize it, right? System D knows that this service went down. System D will then tell Herte, the, mon the, the tool that we have, uh, our, our Kubernetes, right, our lightweight orchestrator, will then tell Herte, will then send that, a message to the, the main node that's monitoring the system. That Herte on that system will then relay that to the monitoring app from the vendor, so the car company. To software, and then the car company software will take action like notifying the human being you have to take over driving or tell the self-driving car to pull the car over into the breakdown lane, right? So that all has to, but that all has to be realized, right? It's not, you know, just something happened and the car keeps going, right? So. So um, before we get to the other question, one of the things I wanted to, to precise is that there are, there are basically four different levels of uh, functional safety certifications. You, it's basically called ASIL, and it goes from A to D. Uh, and D is the highest level of certifications, uh, and A is the lowest. We are aiming for ASIL B. And it's important to know because things like, as much as we like the brake example, it's actually a bad one because the brakes are not going to be running in an ACLB environment, they are going to be in an ACLD environment because these are critical systems. And these kind of certifications are, it's no longer an operating system, it's a microcontroller. And, and those microcontrollers are ACLD and they are very embedded. So even if, you know, if we were to blow, if, our, if the node in which we run would blow up, the car would still be, it will remain in a, in a state that it can be drive by you someone. You know, all the ASLD functionally safe certified uh, systems will keep on running. So you'll still be able to steer the car, you'll be able to drive the car, you'll be able to, you know, move to the emergency lane, pull brake and safety ends, keep the safety of the, the integrity of the, of the passenger intact. Uh, so we are we are not looking. We like the brake system because it's something we can easily understand. Uh, but it's actually not the best example. Uh, but it is it's easy. It makes it easy to 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 grasp uh, some of the challenges there. Think more cruise control or you know, lane, lane assist things like that. Yeah. Uh, and I'm sorry to come back to your question. There was the. Does that answer it? Okay. <laughs> there was a. I'm sorry. Which Yeah, I mean the, the entire operating system is going to be based on top of RHEL, right? We're not we're not building a brand new operating system here. The the goal is to to take RHEL and prove it's functionally safe. We are going to be modifying slightly the Linux kernel. Uh, we're running in um uh Real-time kernel, and uh, we're modifying the init RD for quick boot up, things like that. But pretty much, we have to fall back on, you know, Red Hat uh, 30 years of experience in an operating system and b building our RHEL and all the all the software. Right? We're not building our own glibc. We're not building anything special. F uh, you know, for the most part, this is RHEL. So it's it's Red, Red Hat Enterprise Linux for a car, is what I would say. <laughs> uh, are we looking at other standards uh, for certification? Uh, no, we're only looking at ISO 26262. Uh, we're also considering ASPICE. 
um, which is, has a lot of overlap with ISO 26262, but just um, looking at different aspects of that as far as our quality management system, but um, uh, so far just um, ISO 26262. Maybe I, I will add to this that, like, you know, we have a working group within the ISO who is trying to improve the current version of the standard to be more, like, let's say, aligned with the modern approaches that we are trying to do, right? So it's, it will not be like in the past that w when you want to have some kind of functionally safe operating system, you will need to print out, like, a bunch of books and the wilderness stamps but it will be much more based on the, on the continuous certification to be able to, to align with the latest changes, right? So, so that's one of the part is that we have a people within the ISO standard who is working on improving uh, the ISO standards to be more aligned with the best practices as we have now. So the question is, uh, if you're targeting SLB, what kind of functional safety software are we speaking about? Uh, the, so the infotainment, the question about the infotainment is, infotainment is not functional safety certified. It's called QM, and that's quality managed. Uh, and that's basically the, you know, the real seat infotainment, uh, the, the GPS to some extent. Um, so what the stack that we're mostly looking into is the ADAS stack, so the advanced driving assistance systems, uh, basically autopilot. Uh, being able to, sorry, no Netflix, no, 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 no. Uh, yeah, net, it's another example that we like to use because it's easy to grasp. Uh, but Netflix is not going to be running on top of, you know, Red Hat is going to run on Android. Yeah. So, so in yeah, it, there'll be a separation. A's will be. We actually support ASL A, which I'm not even sure what that is, but ASL A and ASL B applications. But that could that could be your entire self-driving capabilities in, in the vehicle. Um, so it's it is it, there's a lot. It's a matter of fact. There's very little parts of the system that are ASL C and ASL D, just because they're so expensive. To so it, it's a large framework. QM is is quality managed, which basically means it doesn't have to live up to the standards of functional safety, right? If, if your Netflix app or your, and what I'm really talking about here is we'll be running Android inside of a VM. Um, if, that, if that VM fails, then we, we just put it aside. Now, what we have to guarantee is that the entire QM system will not interfere with the self-driving car. So the self-driving car gets all the priority over the... Uh, Not necessarily. No, no. We, they they we, the, the, they want to combine basically three or four computers total in the car, and then have sensors talking to all the rest of the systems. So uh, right now, uh, my my uh, the firmware in my car gets updated like once or twice a year. When there's a serious problem, it's a new car. When, when, <laughs> when once there's a serious problem, uh, the call the cars get traditionally called. So what's the future of security and other I mean, the, the cars are notoriously bad with security. Yeah. Yeah, so it's like it's going to be like your cell phone. It's going to get up. Uh, no, uh, that that's a, uh, there's lots of questions. We're working back and forth with the vendors uh, on that idea. So they want to have over-the-air over the updates. So the certain parts, the operating system, system itself will be updated maybe twice a year. So the, the base operating system, but the containers that are running inside of the operating system will be updated on using over-the-air updates. So uh, imagine you, uh, and my, my thought would be you park the car in the garage and it hooks onto Wi-Fi and downloads it, but the, the automakers want to be able to update the applications as you're driving around. Now, not replacing the running applications. So imagine you're doing a Podman pull as you're driving along the highway. Okay, but not doing a Podman restart. 
okay, to give you, uh, to make it make it as simple as possible. Um, so they want to have the same experience you have on a cell phone where they, they can update. Um, but they also want us to, they, they, I mean, we just had something come up this week where they talk about how they can protect a USB. They want to update the entire operating system via a USB. So you take it to the dealership. And again, I don't know how this is, if this is US centric or not, but you have to take the vehicle into the, to the dealership and the de dealership will reflash the operating system from a USB stick. And they want to make sure the USB stick is you know, certified somehow. And so there's things like that we have to deal with as well. <laughs> cover that. So as this is getting built on top of well, do you foresee other features other than performance that for your customers might be interested on, like uh, screen features that perhaps the kids or some of the contract can speak about that? So um, let let me know if I get the question correctly. Are there any other features uh, that we are foreseeing in the future about um, what we'd run on top of well? Is that correct? Um, so are there other features that are driven by the automotive use case that will be used outside of the automotive use case? Uh, I think ComposeFS work from Alex is yeah. definitely going to be interesting for the entire Edge ecosystem because uh, the entire Edge ecosystem is going to have the same, so it doesn't have the safety element, but it still has the security element, uh, the same requirement than the cars. Like it's an Edge device that is somewhere far away from a data center and therefore the user has physical access to it and we need to protect the system from the user or, you know, its environment. Uh, so there are definitely work on, on Copons FS that are interesting. Um, it, Quadlet is, uh, is something that landed in Podman for two, uh, and that, is, that was directly driven by the automotive use case. Quadlet is an, is an easy way to, to manage system, dis, uh, to, manage con to start container from system D services. Uh, it's basically, if you, if you do, uh, to, pro 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 to properly start a container using systemd, you have to enter in the exact start line a command that is about three or four lines long depending on the width of your terminal. Uh, Podman makes this, uh, Quadlet, sorry, makes this uh, two lines in a text file and it automatically generates the correct way of invoking Podman runs in your exact start on systemd from a template that's the Quadlet file. And that, that's something that makes it a lot easier to, to run containers from systemd. Uh, one of the advantages, of course, is one of the other advantages of using that is if in the future we optimize Podman uh, to be, you know, to run in the systemd use case, um, you know, we do other optimizations for Podman from, to run container from systemd, uh, you will automatically get these optimizations in Quadlet and you don't have to remember to go and edit all your service files for a systemd service file to add the new parameters or remove the old ones and so on. So you, you keep that in Quadlet and you automatically benefit from it. Yeah, I'm gonna give it to her because there's a lot of functional safety stuff that's funneling back into the rel test suites. So. <laughs> um, yeah, with functional safety, um, there's um, all of the tests that we're taking are derived from the requirements and having to take those and rerun them um, in, in vehicle OS. So yeah, there's a lot of rigor depending on how complex the API is, but essentially the APIs are basically based on man page requirements and then QE has to go and then decompose the man page into low level requirements of taking something that's ambiguous and breaking it down into functional pieces. Um, so there's um, a big, what's that? You get better man pages. Yeah, and, and part of that is reviewing the man pages and ensuring that the man pages are doing what the implementation is and supposed to be doing. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, but there's a lot of rigor, a lot of rigor that's going on um, in the testing aspect with verifying these man pages. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, also, uh, there's a lot of effort going on right now to get Android to work well inside of. Uh, you know, eventually you'll see it'll be easy to run Android inside of Fedora, for instance, as, uh, as, as a VM. So there's a lot, basically, yeah, there's, I mean, Rivos is not 
a huge organization, but there's, there's about 100 people in, in Rivos at this point, and everything we're doing is feeding back into other parts of the, of the vehicle, I mean, of the operating system. Okay, unfortunately, we are out of time, so thanks a lot for coming here. Thanks a lot for the great question. And, and if, you have any, if you have any additional questions, feel free to come to us and ask, and we will be glad to answer you. Thanks a lot.